chapter, Luke chapter 6, verses 46 through 49. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundations on the rock. And when a flood came, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built his house on the rock, on, on the ground, without a foundation, or on the sand, if you will. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Jesus called Peter the rock. He said to Peter, now mind you, he could have chosen a tax collector, or for that matter, he could have chosen Dr. Luke. He had the best education of the bunch. But instead, he chose a fisherman with no education, Peter. And he said to Peter, because of his faith, remember, he was the one that walked on the water while all the others watched. He was the first to say Jesus is the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to Peter, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but the Spirit of my Father in heaven. And so he named Peter the rock upon which he would build his church. Now, mind you, just a few hours later, whenever Jesus was talking about his pending death, he would go to Jerusalem, be hung on a cross, and three days later, be raised from the grave. Peter said, No, Lord, be it far from you. I will protect you. I will not let that happen to you. Now, it would seem like Jesus would say something favorable to words of defense like that. But instead, Jesus said, Get thee behind me, Satan. The same person that he said, I'll build my church on this rock. He's having to remind him that when he is opposing the will of God, he's actually fulfilling the desire of Satan. And he called him basically Satan. Now, was Peter Satan? No. But Satan tempted him, and three times he denied the Lord. And then in John's Gospel, toward chapter 20 or so, they're out fishing with seven disciples, and and Jesus has to ask him three times, Peter, do you love me? Simon Peter, son of, jo son of, son of Bar, Bar Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah, do you, Bar means son of, except in West Texas, Bar means something else, uh, or South Texas. Bar Jonah, son of Jonah, do you love me? More than these, Lord, you know I love you, will feed my sheep. The second time he asked him, Simon, do you love me more than these? Lord, you know I love you, don't break my heart. I love you. Feed my sheep, he said. A third time he asked him. And then I think Peter realized that for every denial, he had to make an affirmation. Because just days before, he had denied the Christ. And now the risen Christ, appearing to him on the seashore with fresh fish and chips cooked for breakfast, the Lord Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Do you really love me? Then serve the sheep. Feed the sheep. You know, if we really love Christ, we will feed his sheep. Now, I know we're going to eat food today. I'm not talking about that kind of food. And I, I'm really happy that we're having food because I, I'm, I'm kind of dependent upon it about three times a day. How about you? Anybody who's a nice thing to have? And the older I get, the more I enjoy sleep. You know, just look forward to that pillow at night where I can lay my head down and enjoy a good night's rest. But you know, I really love to be in the house of God because that's spiritual food. And there's hungry people all around us and we need to invite them to come and, and taste of the good things of God. When we gather here today, it's not just you and me in this building. We're surrounded, according to scripture in 
Hebrews chapter 11, by a great, a great cloud of witnesses. We're surrounded by all those across the years who have been through these doors and have worshiped in these pews and, and, and with their blood, sweat, and tears built this wonderful edifice that you see that we're now worshiping in. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what year this building was built, but I think it was over 100 years ago. What's it say? 1911. Hmm? Yeah, that's over 100. By my math, that's over 100 years. Right? 115 years we've been around. And yet, we're sitting here because of their faithfulness. We have this place to worship because they did not shirk their responsibility. They didn't shrink back from the call of God upon their lives, and they built a house of worship that still stands as a testament to the love of God and the love of Christ in their hearts. And so Jesus built his church on the rock. Now, I know what it's, in, what it's like to build houses on sand. I lived in a community called Sand Springs. I didn't live there, but I, I pastored there. Sand Springs, Oklahoma I had a small church that I helped out for a number of years while I was working part-time. And it was a beautiful chapel. But Sand Springs, Oklahoma is not where you want to build a house. And I looked at some of the real estate in the area. I had a house in Tulsa. But everything in Sand Springs was built on sand. And you couldn't find a house that didn't have a two or three inch crack in the foundation because they had built on the sand. Now Jesus knew about building on the rock. So now I had to find a house in Florida right while I was there. I thought I was going to stay there, but here I am in Texas. I just found out that I like Texas better than Florida. Florida's got nice weather, palm trees, but Texas has, has got good people sweet, loving people. You won't find that in Florida. There's a lot of mean folk who just wake up on the wrong side of the bed every day. You know, it's like the woman, someone asked her, did you wake up grumpy? She said, no, I let him sleep. <laughs> and you know, some people, some people just wake up grumpy and their whole life is grumpy, but Texans just aren't that way. They see the sunny side. You know, the yellow rose of Texas. I'm glad to be back home. And I, but I did buy a house while I was there, and I decided I didn't want to get one on the sand. Well, everything's sand in Florida, right? Now, it's interesting. There's about that much sand, and underneath it is limestone that's very porous. So when I saw three foot of water on the golf course after the hurricane, I thought I was going to be swimming for two weeks. Did you know that water was gone the next morning? It went right down into the, to the rock, sifted through, through that sandstone, and then on to the water table and emptied out in less than 24 hours. So there's porous sandstone everywhere, sand that turned to stone. But my house is built on rock. Matter of fact, I have boulders the size of this pulpit and bigger down in my basement. I have three stories. It sits on a rock shelf. My house is built on a rock and my walls are made of stone. And they have fossils in them, prehistoric fossils. I can see fish fossils from the, I mean, we're talking scales the size of your hand. It was amazing. And the guy that built the house was a collector of fossil rock. So my house is loaded with fossil rock. Isn't that amazing? But when a hurricane hit, this is how well the house is built. A hurricane was going around, it's 80 mile an hour winds. I sat on the back porch and watched the storm and didn't even feel a breeze because the, the, the hurricane winds go around it and don't touch the structure. Whoever built that house knew that they had to build it on a rock and they built it with rock and it's a solid structure. So when the three pigs came along and blew, no, it wasn't that. That's, not, that's a different story. Great was the fall thereof. I'll blow the house down, right? The wolf said. But you see, the church will never be blown down. It's a house built on a rock. And what Jesus is really saying is as long as we will hear his word, which Martin Luther took to heart. You see, he picked up this book 
And he found that there were many things that were happening in the church of his day that were not biblical. And so he just said, we need to stop doing that stuff. And Martin Luther called himself a man of one book. I too am a man of one book. Oh yes, I read my lectionaries and I read my, my original languages, Hebrew and Greek. Yes, I learned, I learned Greek. I never could really learn Hebrew because I, I couldn't get used to reading backwards. They start at the back of the book and they read forward. That, would, that just blows my mind. You know, it's kind of like trying to drive in reverse. You know what I mean? They start at the back of the book and they go this way. So I, I just couldn't. I, it was so alien to me, I just decided I'd major in Greek instead. <laughs> so I do know a little Greek and his name is Zorba. But I, do, I did study it, the exegesis and I learned that you can go to the original language and you'll find some things that you didn't see. For instance, the, the word baptism. A lot of people fuss over what does baptize mean. Did you know the actual Greek? Some people say, well, it means to immerse, so they immerse people. Others say, well, it means to sprinkle, and they sprinkle. But the truth is, it means both. It means to dip with the hand. This is what baptizo means, the Greek word. To dip with the hand, to sprinkle, to immerse, or to pour. So the Greek word means all of those things. And to decide that you want to choose one over the other, well, it means that you could be, uh, frankly, if it's water, I think you'll get wet enough to be baptized, right? You heard about the two preachers that were arguing over how much water you need to get baptized, right? And so the one fellow said, what if it's up to my knees? Can I get baptized? No, you need more water than that. What if it's up to my waist? Can I? No, you need more water. You got to immerse totally whole under the water to a hook, line, and sinker. What about up to just the tippy top of my head? I got wet except my hair. And so the preacher said, no, that's the, that's the most important part. And so the Lutheran pastor said, that's why we baptize that. <laughs> it's not how you were baptized, it's that you were baptized. We believe in one Lord, one faith, one baptism. If you were baptized once, that's enough. Amen? One and done. Everybody say one and done. One and done. It's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. <laughs> so we don't need to fuss over things, over silly arguments. We're called to unity, we're called to joy, and we're called to be just as happy as that baby is right now singing. We should be that happy to be in God's house. And I believe that God has called you and me to be a part of a church that will never end. You see, we're going to a place called heaven where we're, we're going to rejoice forever with the saints of God who've gone before us. And that great cloud of witnesses that are actually looking down upon us today, many of which worshiped in these same views, are smiling down from heaven knowing that the work that they started continues to this day and will not stop tomorrow, but will continue. COVID can't stop us. Politics can't stop us. Nothing can stop the church of the living God. And we are going to march forward for Jesus Christ until his kingdom comes and his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. 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 So be proud to be a people of one book. There's a lot of people out there that are confused. But one thing I've learned about, this is why I'm a Lutherian. I like that word. I'm a Lutherian because you haven't changed this book. And this book is your number one source for truth. And that's my book. It's your book. Let's be a people of one book and be proud to hold up the scriptures and say this is the way to life. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He is building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's why Martin Luther wrote this great hymn that we're about to sing. A mighty fortress is our God. His church will never fail. This is the rock upon which he built it. And because we do his word and don't just hear it, we're not like the one who built their house on the sand, being a forgetful hearer and not a doer of the word. But we're, we're hearers and doers of the word of God. We hear it, we place it into action in our lives, and we believe it. We live it. 
That's what God has called us to do. We are people of the book. The word of God. The way to life eternal. Paul said this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. This is the word of the Lord.